Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Can you all, can you all hear me? I don't know why. I can, is there a way that can be put up a little bit? Uh, Alice, you... Um, the subject is a vast one, and it's a very complicated one. Um, I always talk about my, what was it, clarity, wit, and passion. I'm really not interested in the wit and the passion. I am interested in the clarity, and really the burden of my lectures is information. That's really what I'm interested in, getting people to kind of think about it. But if there's some passion and wit, why not? Um, um, as I say, this is a very complicated subject, and I don't pretend that I have the definitive word. What I want to give you is a, is a sketch uh, of, of it, an overview uh, and try to put it into some kind of perspective. And, and as I say, it's not the last word. And I also want to give you a lot of information about it, which I want to put, to, which I'm putting together for a new book, not, not Dirty Truth, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, but another one I'm doing, which will be out in the fall, called Memories of a, what is the name of it? Mem <laughs> Memory, Memories of a Future Politics is the name of the book, and that might not even be the name of this talk. In part, that's part of what it is. I think the overthrow, and I call it not the fall of communism, but the overthrow of communism took place, and much of the credit for this should go to the Western forces that tirelessly dedicated themselves to that task, using every means available short of outright nuclear attack. The end of communism came with remarkably little violence. The communists gave up power almost without firing a shot. Maybe the one exception was in uh, Romania, where there were some killings three deaths in Poland. Lech Wałęsa bragged, he said, we took over power, we overthrew the communists without breaking a single window. window. Well, you know, that says more about his opponents than about him, really. I and mean, that says something because it doesn't fit the picture that we've been given of unscrupulous totalitarians who will stop at nothing to maintain power over captive populations. Why didn't the ruthless Reds act more ruthlessly? I mean, to be sure, these regimes have repressed their opponents. During Stalin's reign, people were executed, interned, forcibly relocated. The Western estimates of the Soviet labor camp population varied widely and wildly from 3 million to 100 million, a figure recently pronounced by an academic at Claremont Institute. At least had 100 million victims. He didn't say they were all in the camps. As far as I can tell, those who offer such figures never reveal, reveal how they arrive at them. Many of Stalin's victims were Communist Party officials, managers, military officers, and other strategically situated individuals. Are you all getting an echo and a, fee a feedback, or am I the only one getting it here? Can't hear me. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what to do. There it is. Okay. There it is. Should I start all over? No, you... you know. Don't want you to miss a word. Many of Stalin's victims were party elites, managers, military officers. They were people who were strategically situated. In time, other whole categories of people became suspect, uh, prosperous, private property owners, or kulaks, as they were called, ethnic Germans, Soviet soldiers returning from prisoner of war camps after World War II. Nobody hears this echo but me, is that it? It's driving me crazy. Well, that's right. Boy, the sound systems are really something. I guess what I want to ask in opening on with this thing about Stalin is that the Gulag, with its millions of victims, if you listen to Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov, supposedly existed in the Soviet Union right down to the very last days of communism. If so, as I've asked before, where did it disappear to? That is, when the communist states were overthrown, where were the millions of stricken victims pouring out of the internment camps with their tales of torment? I'm not saying they don't exist, I'm just asking where 
are they? One of the last remaining camps, Perm 35, visited in 1989 and again in 90 by Western observers, held only a few dozen prisoners, some of whom were outright spies, as reported in the Washington Post. Others were refuseniks who had tried to flee the country. The inmates complained about poor quality food, the bitter cold, occasional mistreatment by guards. I should point out that these labor camps were that. They were work camps. They weren't death camps as you had in the Nazism where there was a systematic extermination of the people in the camps. So there was a relatively high survival rate. The visitors also noted that throughout the 1980s, hundreds of political prisoners had been released from the various camps. But hundreds are not millions. Even with the great thaw that took place after Stalin under Khrushchev, when most of the camps were closed down during Khrushchev's time, there was no sign of millions pouring back into Soviet life. The numbers released were in the thousands. Why, where are the victims? Why no uncovering of mass graves? No Nuremberg-style public trials of communist leaders documenting the widespread atrocities committed against these millions or hundreds of millions that we want to believe our friend in the Claremont Institute. Surely the new communist rulers would have, the, the, I should say, the new anti-communist rulers in Eastern Europe and Russia would have leaped at the opportunity to put these people on trial. And the best that the West Germans could do was to charge East German leader Eric Hanukkah and seven of his border guards with shooting persons who tried to escape over the Berlin Wall. It's a serious enough crime, that is, but it's hardly a gulag. In 1955, the former secretary of the Prague Communist Party was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Ah, a gulag criminal. No, it was for ordering police to use tear gas and water cannons against demonstrators in 1988. Is this the best example of bloodthirsty communist oppression that the capitalist restorations could find in Czechoslovakia? An action that doesn't even qualify as a crime in most Western nations, water cannons and uh, <clears throat> tear gas. Are they kidding? No one should deny that crimes were committed, but perhaps most of the gulag millions existed less in reality and more in the buckets of anti-communist propaganda that were poured over our heads for decades. Many people on the U.S. left have exhibited a Soviet bashing, red baiting, that matches anything on the right in its crudity and obligatory persistence. My friend Noam Chomsky just in Z Magazine talked about those, le uh, those leftists who ride into power on the backs of the masses and turn into communist thugs. Norm, Norm, you're not Newt, you're Norm. What are you talking like that for? Um, communists, we're told, hunger for power rather than wanting the power to end hunger. Those of us who refused over those years to join in the Soviet bashing, which by the way reached rather frothy levels by the Reagan years, we were branded as Soviet apologists and Stalinists, even if we disliked Stalin and his autocratic system of rule. My real sin, I decided, which I plan to commit again tonight, and which I've already committed, is that I questioned, rather than uncritically embraced, the media propaganda images and stereotypes about existing communism. My other sin, which I also plan to commit, is that I also said and still say that there were positive things to consider about existing communist systems. Regarding the Soviet Union, here was a nation that threw back and destroyed the Nazi beast and sustained 80% of the Allied losses in the war, 22 million dead. I thought that that was a debt that humanity owed the Soviet people. Here was a nation that in three decades made industrial advances equal to what it took capitalism a century to accomplish, while feeding and schooling its children rather than working them 14 hours a day, as the capitalists did during the Industrial Revolution, as the, and as capitalists are still doing today in many parts of the world. Here was a nation that provided vital assistance, material, military, medical, armed assistance to liberation movements in Vietnam, Cuba, Nicaragua, South Africa, Angola, and other countries. As Nelson Mandela pointed out, I heard him on a TV show in Washington when he was visiting here in 1990, and the announcer 
And the announcer, of course, was doing his usual things. He says, well, the U.S. has done this, and the Soviets have done that, so uh, we know both. He was, he's doing the balancing act. You have to always uh, do that. D uh, dumping on both of them, he said, what do you say, Mr. Mandela? And Mandela said, please do not denounce the Soviet Union. They have been our great friends and given us valuable aid in the struggle against apartheid and racism. Uh, only Mandela could get away with saying that on national TV. <laughs> Here was one of the few countries that for all its injustices and dysfunctional structures, and I am going to talk about those things, be patient, did guarantee its citizens some minimal economic security. Here was another positive thing that's never mentioned, a country that performed the rescue and survival of three million Soviet Jews during World War II. I mean, many Jews were killed in World War II because many Russians, period, because they were just in the war and fighting but three million Soviet Jewish civilians were saved, which is more than you can say happened to Jews in Poland and most of Eastern Europe, in Germany and Croatia. Left anti-communism was, and it still is, as orthodox and dogmatic as the mainstream or the more extreme McCarthyite varieties, in that it doesn't tolerate anything positive being uttered about existing communist systems, except possibly Cuba, for some reason, and the Cuban system is exactly a Soviet system. A one party, women's federations, the role of the trade union movement, the role of the youth groups is exactly the same model. But Cuba is kind of looked at warmly, which is nice. I guess we'd be grateful for small things. Left anti-communism expects nothing less than a blanket condemnation of communist countries as Stalinist monstrosities, historic and moral aberrations. I prefer, I prefer what psychologists call differential object appraisal, that you look at something and you see it in very differentiated things. Some things good, some things not so good, regardless of what the political orthodoxy is, regardless of what the advice is about maintaining your credibility and so making sure that you say these other things. In reaction to this anti-Sovietism, anti-communism, many communists overcompensated by going to the other extreme, by refraining from uttering or even tolerating, listening to a critical word about the autocratic or problematic features of the Soviet Union. Pro I mean, problem-ridden features. I got into more than one altercation trying to make a criticism of the Soviet system with friends and acquaintances in the Communist Party. I can recall a friend of mine, a party member here in the U.S., who assured me that there was no prostitution in the Soviet Union. I mean, here was a woman, she was in her mid-40s, a grown woman of some experience, saying to me that in this nation of, what, 300 million people, there was no prostitution. I remember, I couldn't believe it. I remember when I was in the Soviet Union in Moscow, the guide saying to me, there was no prostitution in my country. Another grown, mature woman and I said to her, I said, there may be no prostitution in your country, but there's a hell of a lot of it here in this hotel. <laughs> let's get real. Come on, let's get real. We're talking about this very messy, imperfect thing called a human being. And the social organizations they developed which were even more messy and imperfect than they. Well, she, you know what her response was? She said, without batting an eye, she said, well, those women also have regular jobs during the day, I would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thereby giving new meaning to the term working girl. Eh? <laughs> Some say that the upheavals in Eastern Europe don't constitute a defeat for socialism because socialism never existed in those countries. What you had there was state capitalism, or some such thing. Well, whether we want to call them socialists or not is a matter of definition. Suffice it to say that they constituted something different from what existed in the profit-driven capitalist world, as the capitalists themselves were quick and persistent to recognize. First, the productive forces in these countries were not organized for capital gain and private enrichment, as with capitalism. Public ownership supplanted private ownership. 
the perks that were enjoyed by party and government elites were relatively modest compared to the elites in most civilizations. Yes, it's true, Soviet leaders like Yuri Andropov and Brezhnev had big dachas where they entertained foreign visitors. Yes, it's true, they had limousine services and they lived in fairly large apartments in a housing project specially set aside for government leaders near the Kremlin. I saw it, it's a big, big, ugly old, very inauspicious building. That's where the leaders of the Soviet Union lived. But it was larger than what ordinary Soviets would get. But nobody in the Soviet Union could hire the labor of others and extract great personal wealth from that labor. The degree of inherited wealth was also relatively modest and limited. The income spread between highest and lowest earners in the Soviet Union was about three or four to one, as compared to 40 or 50 to one in the US. In fact, they did a little computation. If you compare Steve Forbes, multi-billionaire Steve Forbes' income to a poverty level wage earner, the spread is more like uh, 10,000 to one, 10,000 times to one. <clears throat> Furthermore, communist countries did not pursue the capital penetration of other countries. They didn't have a profit motive as their motor force. They didn't have a need to constantly find new investment opportunities to be able to invest more, to accumulate more, to invest more abroad as under capitalism. The Soviet Union's trade and aid relations were generally economically favorable to Eastern European nations, Cuba, and India. A real socialism, it's argued, would be controlled by the workers themselves through direct participation instead of being run by Leninists, Stalinists, Castroites, or other ill-willed evil leaders and bureaucrats who betray revolutions, we hear. Well, unfortunately, this pure socialism view is profoundly ahistorical and non-falsifiable. By that I mean it remains untestable against the actualities of history. It, comp it compares an ideal against an imperfect reality, and sure enough, reality comes off a poor second. The pure socialist ideological anticipations remain untainted by existing practice. They don't explain how a complex revolutionary society could be built and secured, how priorities could be set, how, how survival could be achieved by just having the workers own and control everything. How do you get expropriate enough surplus value to build an army to defend yourself against the invasion that comes? It's no surprise that the pure socialists support every revolution except the ones that succeed. The pure socialists usually blame the left for every defeat by the left. They weren't vigorous enough, they weren't resourceful enough, they didn't mobilize the people enough, they didn't do this enough, they didn't do that enough, they didn't do this enough. They presume to know better than those engaged in the actual struggles. And it's unfortunate they haven't, that they haven't found time to apply their own brilliant insights and leadership genius to producing a successful mass revolutionary movement in our own country. Writing in The Guardian in 1991, Tony Febo questioned this pure socialist position. I want to read you what he said, quote, It occurs to me that when people as smart, different, dedicated, and heroic as Lenin, Mao, Fidel Castro, Daniel Ortega, Ho Chi Minh, and Robert Mugabe, and the millions of heroic people who followed and fought alongside them, all end up more or less in the same place, then something bigger is at work than who made what decision at what meeting, or even what size houses they went home to after the meeting. These leaders weren't in a vacuum, they were in a whirlwind. And the suction, the force, the power that was twirling around them has spun and left this globe mangled for more than 900 years. And to blame this or that theory or this or that leader is a simple-minded substitute for the kind of analysis that Marxists should make. End of quote. For a people's revolution to survive, it must seize state power, and I believe it must use state power for two things. First, it has to break the stranglehold exercised over society's institutions and resources by the wealthy class. Second, it, ha <coughs> it has to withstand the reactionary counterattack that is sure to come internally and externally. The dangers it faces necessitates the development of a centralized state power. Something, by the way, that's not particularly to anyone's liking. Not in the Soviet Russia in 1917, not in Sandinista, Nicaragua in 1980. 
I mean, ideally, it would be a fine thing to have only local, self-directed, worker participation, communitarian socialism with minimal bureaucracy, few police, and no military. And this probably would be the normal development of socialism if socialism were ever allowed a normal development. Throughout its entire 73-year history of counter-revolutionary invasion, I'm talking about the Soviet Union, throughout its entire history of counter-revolutionary invasion, civil war, forced industrialization, Stalinist purges, not Nazi conquest, Cold War, arms race, nuclear threat, trade discrimination, economic embargo, the Soviet Union did not know one day of peaceful, normal development. All these things had a powerfully distorting effect, I believe, on the building of socialism. And you can see the same thing today. I'm sorry. This siege psychology, this siege psychology became very clear in the 1921 Party Congress when Lenin got up, remember, and he said uh, to the worker opposition, he said, no more opposition. We've had too much opposition. We can't take it anymore. Civil war, opposition, opposition from outside the party, opposition inside the party. No more, let's do away with it. And the party congress exploded in cheers and the worker opposition was uh, abolished. I mean, I mean, they were allowed to stay in the party, but they couldn't have an organized opposition caucus in the party anymore. Now, the word was to survive, we needed lockstep party unity, we need a powerful centralized state, open disputes and conflicting tendencies within and without the party, the communists concluded, only create an appearance of division and weakness, and that invites attack by our enemies. That same dilemma, by the way, uh, that same problem of how do you develop a humane society while facing inhumane conditions face the revolutions we saw in our own day. The ones that, that confronted CIA-sponsored wars of attrition in Nicaragua, Mozambique, Angola, and elsewhere. A trail of broken little nations where the revolutionary, revolutionary baby was either strangled in the crib or was mercilessly deformed beyond recognition. The communist governments were further burdened by this incredible legacy of colonialism and maldevelopment. Many people don't realize it, but most of Eastern Europe, before World War II, and certainly after World War II, given the additional destruction, most of Eastern Europe was a third world region. Thousands of villages were reduced to rubble, illiteracy, poverty, disease, coal, hunger, was the common lot among the peasantry and much of the working class as it was before the war. Capital formation was almost non-existent. The same was true of pre-revolutionary Russia. The same was true of pre-revolutionary China. Henry Rosemont, he notes that when the communists liberated Shanghai from the US-sponsored Kuomintang reactionary government in 1949, about the communists found that about 20% of the population in Shanghai, 1.2 million people, were drug addicts. And every morning, special crews of street cleaners, quote, would gather up the corpses of children and adults who had been murdered during the night or died of disease, cold, and starvation. Communism Ladies and gentlemen, I say it without flinching, communism in Eastern Europe, Russia, China, Mongolia, North Korea, and Cuba brought land reform and human services, a dramatic bettering of the living conditions of hundreds of millions of people on a scale never before or never since witnessed in human history. And that's something to appreciate. Communism transformed desperately poor countries into societies in which everyone had adequate food, shelter, medical care, and education. And some of us who come from poor families who carry around the hidden injuries of class are very impressed, are very, very impressed by these achievements and are not willing to dismiss them as economistic. To say that socialism doesn't work is to overlook the fact that it did work and it worked for hundreds of millions of people. But what about the democratic rights that they lost? We hear U.S. leaders talking about restoring democracy to the communist countries. But these countries, with the exception of Czechoslovakia, were not democracies before communism. 
Russia was a czarist autocracy. Poland was a right-wing fascist dictatorship under Pilsudski with concentration camps of its own. Albania was an Italian fascist prote protectorate as early as 1927. Cuba was a US-sponsored dictatorship under that butcher Batista. Lithuania, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria were outright fascist regimes, openly allied with Nazi Germany in World War II. So what exactly, what democracy are we talking about restoring? The socialist countries did not take away any rights that didn't exist there in the first place. Now all of this is not to deny that communist countries suffered internal deficiencies and contradictions that were real factors in their own demise. I'm not trying to blame it. I don't want to blame it all on capitalist encirclement. Oh, if it wasn't capitalist encirclement. I, did mem I remember talking to the Cuban poet and diplomat, uh, Pablo Armandez, um, in Havana, in his house, and he said, by the way, himself often a critic of his own country, he said, but you know, most of our problems are really caused by our enemies. If they weren't here, we could have solved things and developed in such a different way. We would have had so many less burdens with military and security and this, that, and the other thing, and so forth. Still, I think there, is, there are some very real inherent problems in the systems that were built. All of them were burdened with a managerial economic system that tended to stagnate. And by the way, there may not have been any other choice. I'm not saying they were stupid and they shouldn't build it that way. I'm saying given the exigencies of the time, this is what they had to build. But what they had to build had in itself its own contradictions. So that it was a response to historical necessity and yet it began to create problems of its own. The Soviets, for instance, produced many of the world's best scientists. They exported more mental brain power than the best mathematicians and physicists, too. But very little of their theoretical works materialized in actual production during the scientific technological revolution of the 70s and 80s. I mean, their industrial base was roughly still, the, by 1990, their industrial base was roughly still the one that Stalin had built. Gorbachev complained about, quote, the managerial system that rejects scientific and technological progress and new technologies, that is committed to cost ineffectiveness and generates squandering and waste, unquote. But it's not enough to denounce managerial inertia. We also have to explain why such practices persisted despite repeated exhortations from leader after leader. By the way, going back to Stalin, you can hear Stalin ranting about the bureaucrats to Khrushchev when Khrushchev was his assistant, as Khrushchev records in his memoirs. The fact is there were systematic imper there were systemic, I'm sorry, there were systemic imperatives that worked against innovation. Managers got paid whether or not risks were taken or new technology was developed. There was no incentive to innovate. There was a lot of incentive not to innovate. All materials and labor were fully committed according to the plan, so it was difficult to shift resources for new experimental projects and run the risk of lower output during the transition and run the risk of failure. Enterprises never had to pay real value prices for materials and fuel, so they often used these goods inefficiently and wastefully. Improvements in production would lead only to an increase in one's production quota. If we did better, we'd get a bigger quota next year. In effect, well-run, innovative factories were punished with greater workloads. Poorly managed ones that showed a loss were rewarded with state subsidies. Under the pressure to turn out quantity, managers often cut corners on quality. Farmers did the same. For instance, state, the state buyers of meat paid attention to quantity only. So the collective farms, what was their incentive? To maximize profits by, maximize income by producing fatter and fatter animals. Now consumers may not particularly care to eat fatty meats, but that was their problem. But only, but only a fool or a saint would work harder to produce better quality meat for the privilege of getting paid less. You think after 70 years they could work out a, a meat grading system, you know, see. But, but this, this pressure for quantity went right up to the top. Guys didn't want to shake the boat. As in all countries, whether they're capitalist or communist, and by the way, it's interesting, many of these problems you have to say, which of these problems are peculiar to 
socialism, which uh, this, this particular brand of socialism at this stage of historical development that we're talking about now, Eastern Europe, China, Cuba, and the Soviet Union, which of these are peculiar to those areas, and which of them are peculiar, wh which other problems are peculiar, or problems of social organization are peculiar to capitalism? You have quite a list there. And which are, which are in fact universal? In the, which of them are just part of the nature of, of social organization in a certain way? That, that's a whole other <coughs> lecture maybe. I don't want to get into that. Let me just say that certainly bureaucracy, which is often ascribed to being a particular component of socialism, it was found in our society all over the place too. And we have some interesting things to say about it later when, from, from the East German perspective. Bureaucracy tends, whether it's capitalist or communist, tends to become a self-feeding animal. In, in, uh, <clears throat> in the existing socialist countries, there were, there were enterprises in which the administrative personnel increased at a faster rate than productive workers. Well, that's, that's nothing. I remember there are at least two universities I taught at. One was uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook and the other was the University of Vermont, both of which went through fast growth periods. And it was very interesting what happened. The student body would go up about 20% over a certain number of years. The faculty would go up about 24%, 18%, something like that, roughly in the same range. And administration would go up 70%. <laughs> and we'd say, what do all these guys do? What is the assistant associate deputy dean to the uh, curriculum of this and that? What does this guy do besides call, up, call each other up and keep each other busy and sending us all these memos to, that we had to fill out because they had some idea about this and that? Um, well, uh, applause from some, angry murmurs from the school administrators that are in the audience. <laughs> There were enterprises in socialist countries. A factory with 11,000 production workers might have 5,000 administrative staff. A considerable burden. The heavy bureaucratic mode of operation did not allow for critical self-corrective feedback. The fate of the whistleblower was the same in communist countries as in our own. Those who exposed incompetence and corruption were more likely to run risks than receive rewards. It also led to uh, a, a, a rather out of touch leadership. In 1990 in Washington DC I attended a press conference held by the Hungarian ambassador who announced that his country was abandoning their socialist system because it didn't work. So I raised my hand and I said, so why didn't it work? It'd be interesting discussion. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I wanted to go up and grab the guy by the lapels and say, schmuck, I mean, listen, you, excuse me, New Yorkism there, you, you are one of the people presiding over this process and you admit you have no idea what was going on in the process. I and mean, it's rather remarkable, isn't it? Well, by the way, I'm using the past tense, but just about all the problems that I'm talking about still exist in the remaining communist states of North Korea, Cuba, and Vietnam. If you talk to the inhabitants of communist countries, you discovered that they complained less about an overbearing totalitarianism, I and mean, that's what we always got in the media, this totalitarian thing weighing on us, and their complaints generally were rather the opposite. What we used to hear was that they more often complained about the absence of responsible control, that nobody seemed to be minding the store. Maintenance people failed to perform needed repairs. Occupants of a new housing project regularly refused to pay rent and no one bothered to collect it. Poor management and harvesting, storage and transportation ca caused as much as 30% of all produce to be lost between field and store. Tons of meat were left to spoil because they'd never got it together with proper refrigeration. And not surprisingly, there was ample opportunity for corruption and favoritism. The factory director who accepted bribes to place people at the top of a waiting list to buy cars. The deputy minister who got caught using state materials to build his vacation home. 
Rewards seem to lie in operating around the system or even against it. If you operate it that way, that's when you got rewarded. For instance, the poorer the restaurant service, the fewer the number of clients. The fewer the clients, the less work and the more food left over that I could take home or sell on the black market. The last thing that restaurant personnel, restaurant personnel wanted was satisfied customers who would keep returning to dine at the officially fixed, artificially low prices. I mean, that's why the restaurants were so awful in socialism. So the system actually offered many disincentives. In 1979, Cuban leader Raul Castro, Fidel's brother, complained about fraudulent work practices. He noted the absenteeism, fake work reports, deliberate slowdowns so as not to surpass work norms, norms that were fixed at artificially low levels. In most communist countries, one got the impression that everyone as a worker seemed to be conspiring against everyone as a consumer. Now that's overstated. Obviously some things were done. I mean, buildings were built, people had clothing, the books were excellent. There was one product that they produced which, was, which were made of excellent quality. Uh, the public transportation system was excellent. I mean, so there were some things. I mean, so obviously some people were doing some work. Communists, I don't want to overstate it, but I'm giving you what part of, uh, a major problem was. I remember one Soviet guy said to me, you, you people are tired from working so hard. Because I said, you, you don't work as hard as we do. Uh, he said, you don't, you're tired of working so hard, we're tired of waiting on lines all the time. And I thought, well, if you work a little harder, there wouldn't be so many lines. Communist economics had an Alice in Wonderland aspect to it. In that, I mean, it's rather remarkable that the price of just about every commodity in service bore no relation to the actual cost or value, except for expensive luxury items. With prices held so artificially low, there was a great disparity between purchasing power and the supply of goods and services. And this, in turn, affected work performance. I listened to an East German friend complain about poor services and inferior products. He said, the system doesn't work. This doesn't happen. You go to the hospital and they haven't washed the floors and the woman who was supposed to wash them won't do it. She doesn't show up for work. Said, it doesn't work. The system doesn't work. And I remember saying to him, but Klaus, what about the free education, the public health care system, and the numerous other social benefits that are so lacking here in the United States and in much of the capitalist world? Aren't those things valued? And his response was very interesting. He looked at me and he said, oh, nobody ever talks about those. And that shows you that people took for granted the way the human services and entitlements, they took for granted the human services and entitlements while they were hungry for the consumer cornucopia that they imagined existed for everyone in the West. Once our needs are satisfied, then our wants tend to escalate. Indeed, our wants become our needs. From Cuba to China, from Russia to Laos and Vietnam, there were intellectuals and professionals who had relatively good living standards who yet wanted to live still better. They wanted to travel abroad. They wanted to see Paris. They wanted greater opportunities made available to persons uh, like themselves. Uh, <clears throat> they wanted the same kind of opportunities that were available to persons uh, of means in the capitalist world. By 1989, those who fled from Vietnam, according to a Washington Post story, were neither desperately poor nor persecuted political dissidents. To quote one, I don't think my life in Vietnam was bad. In fact, I was very well off. But it's human nature to always want something better. Another one, quote, they left for the same reasons we did, referring to some other people. They wanted to be richer, just like us. And similar testimonies could be gleaned from Eastern European emigres, maybe not as blatant, but something like that. The longing was usually not for an abstraction called democracy, but for the cornucopia of the West, in most cases, not always. As living standards rise, so do expectations rise. People are not necessarily grateful for what they already have. This seems to be especially true among the young who have no memory of pre-revolutionary deprivations. Generally, the two most discontent groups in social societies are the intellectuals and the young, the two groups that know everything. <laughs> in Cuba today, many youth see no value in joining the Communist Party 
They think Fidel has had his day and he ought to step aside. The revolution's accomplishments in education and medical care are something to take for granted. They can't get too excited about it. They're fed up with the shortages. For them, the revolution is history, something that their parents got all excited about. If they have any collective passion, it's for the latest clothing styles and music from North America. Generally, they're more concerned with their own personal future than with collective betterment or socialism. I remember when I first went to Cuba in 1974, the, the, the slogan at that time was, our only privileged group are our youth. And I remember saying, that's your first mistake. <laughs> now, see, even in the best of societies, there may not be enough rewarding jobs. Much of labor in society has an instrumental value, but it doesn't have any inherent value. Uh, you can be given a job, you know, work for build the revolution, and it means painting walls all day, painting walls. Well, you know, after a while, uh, the, the revolution begins to lose its luster. And, you, and the, the, the more efficiently and quickly you paint one wall, you're just going to have another wall to paint. And if you paint them slow or fast, you get paid the same. So what's the big thing? Uh, there just isn't enough interesting and creative work to go around for all who consider themselves to be interesting and creative people. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> Many of the intellectuals under communism were not only anti-Marxist, but to the point of being full-fledged adulators of Western reactionism. The more rapidly anti-communist, the more reactionary chic a position was, the more appeal it had. They were ferociously opposed to their own system. They were utterly gaga and starry-eyed about America and unwilling to look at the senior side of U.S. society and global capitalism. They were utterly racist toward minorities in their own country and in the United States, their attitudes. As the editor of the Wall Street Journal put it, writing an article in the National Review, you can't get any more conservative than that, I quote him, they love Ronald Reagan, Marlboro cigarettes, and the South in the American Civil War. The Eastern European intellectuals supported every U.S. armed intervention abroad and every U.S. armed escalation as defensive. They openly detested the U.S. peace movement. That's true of Andrei Sakharov. That's something you never got in the media. He openly detested and criticized the U.S. peace movement. They never had an unkind word for fascist regimes that were faithful U.S. client states. And they directed snide remarks at those of us who did. You could read Sakharov on that too. Their, their advocacy, their support of dissent, did not extend to opinions that deviated to the left of them. They tolerated dissent that was to the right of them, but not to the left, as is true with many people here. In 1990, one of their Moscow publications, Literaturnaya Gazet, Gazeta, Literary Gazette in English, I, I read it in English translation, so I might as well use the English title, right? It hailed Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush as statesmen and called them the architects of world peace. This was in 1990, while the Soviet Union still exists. Under Glasnost, you were getting these new publications coming out. It questioned the need for a ministry of culture in the Soviet Union. Quote, there is no such ministry in the United States, and yet it seems there's nothing wrong with American culture. <laughs> so who said Russians don't have a sense of humor? <laughs> Many of them thought that they could keep all the securities of communism and overlay it with capitalist consumerism. They thought that uh, if they were laid off from work, if their factory was privatized, the government was going to find them another job. We can talk to Polish workers. That, but they just assumed that everything they had was going to stay and they were going to get this other whole new thing. They didn't get it. They really, now they're getting it. Boy, are they getting it right up the kazoo. <clears throat> now, by the way, not everyone sm swallowed the free market mythology. In the 1989-91 period of overthrow and transition, there were opinion polls in Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Russia, and East Germany. And these were reported in the U.S. press. It showed that most people, most people still opted for state ownership or some modified form of socialism. The numbers who actually wanted free market capitalism were surprisingly small. When anti-communist governments took power in Russia and Eastern Europe, they set about suppressing the communist and socialist left in the name of democratic reform. 
In late 1993, facing resistance to his free market policies, Boris Yeltsin forcibly disbanded the Russian parliament and every other elected representative body in the country, including all the regional and city councils. He abolished Russia's constitutional court and launched an armed attack upon the parliamentary building, killing hundreds of resistors, estimates are about 3,000 actually, and demonstrators. Thousands were rounded up and detained. Opposition leaders were jailed without trial. Hundreds of elected and appointed officials were placed under investigation. Some are still in jail. Yeltsin banned labor unions from all, over, uh, from, from all political activities. He suppressed dozens of publications and television shows. He exercised monopoly control over all broadcast media. He outlawed 15 political parties. He rewrote the Constitution, giving the executive nearly absolute power over legislation. For these crimes, he was treated as a defender of democracy and reform by US leaders and the media. What they most liked about Yeltsin was, to quote the San Francisco Chronicle, Quote, he has never wavered in his support for privatization of state-owned industries. I think that really says it all. In the various Eastern European countries, Marxists were purged from all public employment. Communist Party assets acquired and paid for by party members were arbitrarily confiscated. The same in Germany, in Russia, in the Czech Republic, Vaclav Havel seized the properties of the Socialist Union of Youth. These included campsites, recreation halls, and cultural and scientific facilities for children. These were liquidated and put under the management of joint stock companies at the expense of the youth who were left to roam the streets. In Russia, Boris Yeltsin twice suspended the Communist Party newspaper Pravda. He eventually turned the party's 12-story building and its press over to a pro-Yeltsin government newspaper that became the full owner. Yeltsin's police have continued to attack political demonstrators in Moscow and other cities. Two parliamentary deputies, one independent, the other a communist, were, who, vigorous, who vigorously opposed the Yeltsin government, were assassinated. In 1994, journalist Dmitry Kolodov, who was probing corruption in high places, was assassinated. Reactionary, anti-Semitic, crypto-fascist parties and hate campaigns have surfaced in the former communist countries, along with the desecration of Jewish cemeteries and xenophobic attacks against foreigners of darker hue. Lech Wałęsa, quote, a gang of Jews got hold of the trough and is bent on destroying us, unquote. Later on, Lech Wałęsa said he was misinterpreted he did not mean all Jews, only the greedy ones. <laughs> I remember how many people on the left adored Lech Wałęsa, a worker hero who was going to bring true socialism. Yeah, right. <clears throat> In Czechoslovakia, Poland, and elsewhere, museums that commemorated the heroic anti-fascist resistance were closed down, and monuments to the struggle against Nazism were removed. In countries like Lithuania, former Nazi war criminals were exonerated. Some were even compensated financially for the years they spent in jail. The first president of, uh, of the anti-communist Czechoslovakia and later president of the Czech Republic, Vaclav, Vaclav Havel, another guy who was adored among some of the academics here, he took personal ownership of public properties that had belonged to his wealthy family 40 years before. Havel, the man of peace, sent Czech troops into the Gulf War, into the war that killed 100,000 Iraqi civilians. Havel sent arms to the fascist regime in Thailand. Havel voted with the United States to condemn human rights violations in Cuba, but he's never uttered a word of condemnation of human rights in El Salvador, Colombia, Guatemala, Indonesia, Thailand, and any other U.S. client state. Havel, the great Democrat, signed a law that made the advocacy of communism a felony with a penalty of up to eight years imprisonment. He signed another law barring communists and former communists from employment in all public agencies. Havel warned labor unions not to involve themselves in politics. Some militant unions had their property taken from them and handed over to compliant company unions. In the Czech and Slovak republics, Former aristocrats or their heirs were being given back all the lands and estates they had held before 1918 under the Austro-Hungarian autocracy. Prince Franz Joseph lives, including, by the way, all the new homes that were built on these lands. <clears throat> 
In Latvia and Lithuania, communist leaders have been tortured and imprisoned for protesting free market inequities. Some are held without any trial. When Estonia held its first free election, free election in quotes in 1992, 42% of the population were disqualified from citizenship and prohibited from voting because of their Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, or Jewish antecedents. Oh, the flowering of democracy works its wonders in mysterious ways, especially in the free market. <clears throat> In 1990, as the Soviet Union was preparing for its fatal plunge into, free market, into the free market paradise, Bruce Gelb, Bruce Gelb, who was head of the USIA, told a reporter that the Soviets would benefit from U.S. business education because, quote, the, bi the vipers, the bloodsuckers, the middlemen, that's what they need. That's what needs to be rehabilitated in the Soviet Union. That's what makes our kind of country click. <laughs> Quoted in the Washington Post, Bruce Gelb, one of the leading intellectuals of the Republican Party. The vipers and bloodsuckers have arrived in Russia, Eastern Europe, and China. Consumer goods are more abundant than ever. Thousands of luxury cars are on the streets of cities like Moscow and Prague. Rents and real estate prices have skyrocketed. Stock exchanges have sprung up all over China, Russia, and Eastern Europe. A new class of investors, speculators, and racketeers are wallowing in wealth. And with that accumulation of wealth comes, with the, uh, with the uh, enrichment of the few comes the impoverishment of the many. The professed goal in these countries is no longer to provide a better life for everyone, but to improve opportunities for individuals to pursue personal gain and amass great fortunes. So what has this brought for the many? A dramatic rise in unemployment, homelessness, drug addiction, air and water pollution, tuberculosis, cholera, polio, prostitution, teenage rape, child abuse, and just about every other social ill. Beggars, pimps, dope pushers, and other hustlers ply their trade as never before. In, in countries like Russia and Hungary, the suicide rate has climbed 50% in a few years. There's been a decline in nutritional levels and a sharp deterioration in health. One third of Russian men now never lived to the age of 60. The death rate has risen nearly 20% for East German women in their late 30s and nearly 30% for men of the same age. In contrast, where communist governments are still in power, Cuba, North Korea, and Vietnam, death rates continue to fall, according to that communist publication, the New York Times. That's where I got that one. Prominently displayed on page 24A, on the lower left-hand side in the deep, on the <clears throat> it was the 26th paragraph of a long article. <clears throat> Occupational safety is now almost non-existent and workplace injuries and deaths have drastically climbed. In China, there are workers who now put in 12 to 16 hours a day for subsistence pay without regularly getting a day off. The market reforms in China have brought a return of child labor. See, that's why U.S. leaders like China, but they don't like Cuba. You hear these people say, well, we're friends with China, but we're still hostile to Cuba. How irrational. Just because you don't understand the policy, it doesn't mean they don't understand it. The key is the relationship of capital to labor. And in China, labor is being imprisoned. And in China, capital has been unleashed in its rawest, most vicious free market way. And that's not true in Cuba. In Cuba, nobody works 12 to 14 hours a day. In Cuba, the human services haven't been cut back. And that's the problem of Cuba. That's where Cuba still has to reform. In Eastern Europe and, the, and Russia, work of vacation resorts, clinics, cultural centers, daycare centers, and other features that used to make communist enterprises something more than just workplaces, they have just all about disappeared. Worker rest homes have been redone as gambling casinos and nightclubs for the nouveau riche. School lunches, which were once free or very low priced, are too costly for many pupils. Hungry children now constitute a serious school problem. After only one year of its free market paradise, Russia saw its consumer spending drop almost 
Now, just to give you uh, uh, what, what that means, in the Great Depression, in the first three years, it took three years, in the first three years, consumer spending dropped 21% over three years. Now here, in one year, you had almost four, actually more like 38, 38 some point something percent. <clears throat> in the former communist countries, 70 to 85%, it varies from country to country, 70 to 85% now live below or not far above the poverty level, many of them in absolute economic desperation. The eastern countries are also, and this may be one of the most significant points, they also are being recolonized by Western capital. The pattern of trade is becoming third world. If you look at third world countries, you find they do very little trade with each other, even right next door. All their economies are geared to the West, extracted from the West. That's exactly what's happening now in Eastern Europe, where there used to be an enormous trade between various Eastern European and Soviet Union countries. Uh, they, the very little trade between them now, almost all of it is with the West. The West has come in and has pretty much taken over. Multinational corporations are moving into Russia to exploit the vast oil, gas, and mineral reserves with, with enormous profits and little benefit going to the people. Big private companies will enjoy easy loans, cheap labor, speed ups, broken labor unions, and no taxes. It's the third world all over again, ladies and gentlemen. U.S. timber interests, with the financial support from a venture fund sponsored by the Pentagon, our tax money, are preparing to clear cut the Siberian wilderness, a region that holds one fifth of the planet's forests and is the habitat of rare species. And this is being done over the protests of U.S. and Russian environmentalists. Private investment has brought a decrease rather than an e increase in production. Understand that. State enterprises are being driven into bankruptcy as private investment comes in. In the Czech Republic, nearly 80% of all enterprises have been privatized and most of them have been decapitalized. They've been rubbed out in effect. Industrial production shrank by two-thirds. In Poland, with privatization, production has shrunk about one-third. In Macedonia, one of the breakaway republics of Yugoslavia, a labor representative noted, quote, privatization seems to mean the destruction of our companies. Macedonians complain about how work has taken over their lives. One has no time to care about others. There's no time even for oneself, only time for work and for making money. That was on the PBS report. <coughs> Thousands of cooperative farms have been forcibly broken up over the protests of their members. Agricultural output has consequently plummeted in, the, in these countries. The new private farmers find they can't produce for a commercial market. They're unable to get loans or seeds or machinery. They're rapidly losing their holdings or they're reverting to subsistence farming. Hungary's agricultural cooperatives, which by the way was one sector of the socialist economy that performed very well, with, but with privatization breaking up the cooperatives, farm output has plunged 40%, according to that biased communist publication, the Los Angeles Times. Now that's not stupid. That's not irrational or wasteful. That's the goal. The goal is to decapitalize Eastern industry and agriculture so it doesn't compete on the European market. To turn it into a colonized third world, a cheap labor, a cheap resource region. 1992, the Lithuanian government decreed that former owners and their descendants could reclaim land and other property confiscated during the socialist era. <clears throat> Ten, that, mean, that meant that tens of thousands of farming families, about 70% of the rural population has been evicted from land that they worked for over half a century, completely destroying the country's agricultural base in the process. In East Germany, much of the industrial and agricultural production was destroyed to prevent competition with heavily subsidized Western firms and farms. East Germans have a very interesting series of complaints that they're making now with unification. They complain that the net flow of money has been from the East to the West in what amounts to the colonization of the East. They complain that the free market is a myth, that the Western economy is fully regulated and rigged against the interests of the East. They complain that West German police are much more brutal than were the East German police. 
that, in, that if West Germany had denazified anywhere near as thoroughly as they're forcing the East to desocialize, they would have had a totally different country. A startling discovery made by citizens from communist countries is the amount of bureaucracy in the West. Soviet immigrants in Canada have complained that, bureau quote, bureaucracy here was even worse than at home, according to an article by Hans Blumenfeld, Monthly Review. East Germans now under West German rule are staggered by the flood of complicated forms they have to fill out for taxes, health insurance, life insurance, unemployment compensation, job retraining, rent subsidies, bank accounts. Because of the kind of personal information they have to give, they feel less privacy than in the GDR, according to a report in Z Magazine. In Russia, organized crime now extorts tributes from 80% of all enterprises. Its tentacles reach right into the top echelons of government. Contract murders number in the thousands every year. Street crime has also sharply increased. In Hungary, there's been a 50% increase in murder since the fall of communism. According to the New York Times, <clears throat> the police force in Prague, in the Czech Republic, today is many times greater than it was under communism when relatively few police were needed. Now, isn't that interesting? Few, very few police in the communist police state. Figure that out. I don't get it. Is there something they're not telling me? <clears throat> There's been a drastic decline in cultural life. Theaters are now sparsely attended because tickets are so prohibitively expensive. Publicly owned movie industries in countries like Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the GDR that occasionally produced some worthwhile films are being defunded or bought out by Western interests, and they're now making cartoons, TV commercials, and music videos. Movie theaters in the Eastern countries are being taken over by Western chains, and they now offer many of the same Hollywood junk films that we have the freedom to see. <laughs> Subsidies for the arts... <clears throat> Subsidies for the arts and literature have been severely cut. During the communist era, three out of every five books produced in the world were produced in the Soviet Union, including inexpensive but quality classics and, content of con of classics and books by contemporary authors from Latin America and Africa and Asia and poets from all over the world. Today, as the cost of books, periodicals and newspapers have skyrocketed, today, as education has declined, Readership has shrunk almost to third world levels. Books of a Marxist or otherwise critical left perspective have been removed from bookstores and libraries throughout almost all these countries. In East Germany, the Writers Association reported one instance in which 50,000 tons of books, some of them brand new, were buried in a dump after unification. The, you see, the German officials can't quite get themselves to burn them like in the old days. <clears throat> Education is now accessible only to those who can afford the costly tuition. Curricula have been depoliticized, as they call it, meaning that a left perspective critical of imperialism and capitalism has been replaced by a conservative one. The same thing has happened in the news media. Both public and private media have been purged of leftists and restaffed by persons with acceptable ideological orientations so that they're almost indistinguishable from our own media. This process of moving toward a pro-capitalist ideological monopoly has been described in the Western media as democratization and reform. There's also been a very sharp increase in gender inequality. The new Russian constitution eliminates provisions that, that guaranteed women the right to paid maternity leave, um, <coughs> prenatal care, job security during pregnancy, affordable daycare centers, and all that. In all communist countries, about 90% of the women had jobs. Today, in the post-communist countries, women compose over two-thirds of the unemployed. Women are being driven from the professions in disproportionate numbers and are now advised against getting professional training. Prostitution is the one booming industry open to enterprising women in the free market, catering to foreign and domestic businessmen. Divorce, abortion, and birth control are more difficult to obtain. The financial and psychological independence that women used to enjoy under socialism is pretty much gone. You see how your own personal psychological independence is in part determined by social structures and social arrangements, what your options are, what your opportunities are, and all that. 
and that can be destroyed. In Russia, uh, instances of sexual harassment and violence against women have increased sharply, as in the other countries. In Russia, the number of women murdered, primarily, primarily by husbands or boyfriends, has skyrocketed from 5,000 to 15,000 in the first three years of the free market paradise. For 15,000 a year. An additional 57,000 women <coughs> were seriously injured in such assaults in 1994. These official figures, these official figures, they understate the level of violence. The Communist Party committees that used to intervene in cases of domestic abuse no longer exist. <clears throat> Throughout Eastern Europe and Russia, many people now grudgingly, they're admitting that life was better under communism. I mean, that's even grudgingly being reported in the U.S. media. So there must be a lot of people saying this, if I keep hearing it so much, even in the U.S. media. There's a joke that circulated in Russia in 1992, in the, after the first year of the free market paradise, and it went like this. Question, what did capitalism accomplish in one year that communism could not do in 70 years? Answer, make communism look good. <laughs> <laughs> Reacting to the pain of the free market, people, Eastern European voters, have begun returning communists to power in Russia too. Bringing them back into power to preside over the ruin and wreckage left by capitalist restoration. Socialism, the system that didn't work, provided everyone with some measure of security. Capitalism, the system that works, has brought a free falling economy and mass misery. And I don't think, and nor are these conditions just part of a temporary transition period. That's what we heard all the time. I remember Tom Brokow, when he was in Russia, interviewing a guy and saying, well, you know, but before you can go up, you've got to go down. This is some, some law of physics he just invented, you know. <laughs> There's a painful transition period that you can work through. In fact, nations can stay a long time in capitalist depression with vast capital accumulation for the few and poverty for the many. Look at Latin America. <coughs> and these communist nations, I think, like all so-called developing nations, are likely to remain in poverty indefinitely, <coughs> so that a privileged few can continue to enjoy unlimited opulence. <coughs> well, the people of these eastern countries wanted to be like America, at least a lot of them did, uh, not knowing what America was like. And instead, they ended up being more like the capitalist third world the same direction that capitalist America is being pushed into. <clears throat> They've suffered, by the way, a momentous historical defeat. And the third world struggles have suffered a tremendous defeat because they can no longer get aid from East Germany or Soviet Union. Um, and what do we learn from this? What I learn is that capitalism is not a benign system, brothers and sisters. It goes after everything. It leaves not a social program in place. It leaves not a tree standing. It leaves not a job or a home or a child feeling secure. It is a ruthless, self-devouring system that will take us and the planet down with it if we don't fight back, if we don't rein it in. <clears throat> If you want to see what our worst future might be, just look at what's happening in Eastern Europe. We, we can see the future and it doesn't work. The loss is also in the West. Capitalism with a human face has become capitalism in your face. They no longer have to worry about competing. They no longer have to tell their workers you've got it better than in the communist countries. They no longer have to do that. They no longer have to tell the third world countries. They're saying, you don't like it? It's too bad. This is what it is. They're going for everything and they want everything. There's only one thing that the ruling classes of history have ever wanted and that's everything. <clears throat> Socialism. Socialism was overthrown, not because it failed, but because it succeeded, at least in part. That is, siege socialism created a society that survived and that was ready to move to consumerism, a dialectic that undermined itself. I think we also then have to pay attention to human nature. We must realize that people are a lot more complex. I remember talking to the East German ambassador in Washington, the GDR, just as things were collapsing. <clears throat> 
the last reception they had there, I said to him, why did you make such junky cars? Those two cylinder putt-putt cars that everybody scorned. He said, well, we actually, we didn't want to put it into cars because the, environmentally they're, and they're so wasteful, they're so costly. We thought if we built up a good mass trans, a good rational, efficient, low cost, effective mass transit system, uh, low polluting, that that would be the way people would go and we wouldn't give them such desirable cars. And we, we were wrong because Germans, he said, Germans like their machines, I guess. Well, it's not Germans, it's Pakistanis, it's Americans, it's, uh, it's uh, Latin Americans, it's all over the world. The automobile, they're crazy for it. See, if you give people the choice between a sane, rational, clean, mass transit system or the, the uh, automobile with its, its personal empowerment, its privacy, its status, its instant mobility, they go for the automobile. And this is what was happening. So we've got to understand that people often don't act the way we want. He made a very revealing statement. He said, you know, we thought that if we built a good society, we would have good people. But that not, that's not necessarily true. Well, it's debatable whether that was a good society indeed. But the point is a very interesting one, that we have to look at the complexities of people. That people have a tremendous capacity for discontent, for wanting more and more. A human organization is a very hard and difficult and often self-defeating thing, that the more you organize it, often the, the, the standard operation, operating procedure often leads you dysfunctional for other kinds of things, <clears throat> that there are particular individuals waiting for their opportunities to be as rapacious and exploiting and victimizing as they can be. They are worse than any creature in the jungle because the creatures in the jungle don't prey and kill for the, just for the fun of it. Human nature, I'm one of the few Marxists in the world that says human nature has to be looked at. I also say it exists. The usual the view is, uh, well, I don't know what you mean. You start talking about human nature. Uh, you see, the conservatives have so used human nature as a concept to justify the horrible social arrangements that we do have that we on the left have had this silly reaction, which is to say, it doesn't exist. What do you mean it doesn't exist? If human beings don't have a nature, we're the only entity in the whole universe that does. All things have a nature. This lectern has a nature. This microphone has a nature. Not a very good one. This, <laughs> this plant has a nature. We all have a nature. <clears throat> oh, we're more like clay. You know, we're very malleable. Well, even clay has a nature. You can spread it just so far. You've got to keep it moist. It can crack. It can do things. There are limits. And we have to then have expectations and understandings of these things and not be so naively enamored with our ideology as to not look at what people are actually doing and capable of. I think human nature is horrible. I think it's terrible. I think human beings, if you read history, it's just horrible. It, it's just horrible and disgusting and, 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 and horrifying. The atrocities, the murder, the torture, the, the plunder, the madness of it. I mean, you can't read history without coming away feeling a very, very odd feeling about your own species, especially the male gender in it, you know? It's really amazing. They're horrible creatures. The women applaud, the men sit silently. But, <laughs> but that's all the more reason. That's all the more reason why we need strong political organization. That's all the more reason why we need a liberating ideology. That's all the more reason why we need democracy. And democracy, we also have to, we also have to keep power out of the hands of these, <coughs> these, of these avaricious ones, especially. Is Marxism irrelevant? Is it the bankruptcy of Marxism? No, Marxism is a system of analysis that critiques existing capitalism and imperialism. It has relatively little to say about socialism. In the communist countries, Marxism was doled out like a catechism. It didn't even relate to their lives. It was like us studying feudalism. It had to do with a different set of social relations than the one they had, although they were desperately in need of a critical theory of their own about their system, as I tried to, in a very sketchy way, map out here today. I mean, I've tried to do an awful lot. I mean, go to the whole, the whole range of the thing, and I know I haven't succeeded all that much in, in any of it, but anyway, you get what I'm doing. We need a strong alternative movement to move both against the Republicrats and Demikins, and not just locally, but nationally and internationally. We need more militancy and resistance. What can we do about it if that's going to be the question? I'm going to answer it right now, so don't ask it. There are no easy answers. What are you willing to do? We can all do a little more, a lot more than we are now doing. Just look at the tables around the hall and sign up and get active. And finally, remember this, that history, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, history never ends. The last page is never written. History is always being rewritten.
and its best passages are not written by the princes or the presidents or the prime ministers or the popes. The best passages are written by the people. For all their faults, the people are all we have. In fact, we are they. Thank you. The question is, on what basis did Andrei Sakharov not like the peace movement? Sakharov, the same, from the same perspective, I'd say Ronald Reagan wouldn't like the peace movement. He, he, had, a, he had a totally pro-Reagan, pro um, anti-Soviet approach regarding the arms race, the East-West conflict, the Vietnam War he thought was a good war that the U.S. was involved in, and it was sorry they didn't win it and all, and all that stuff. But that's, that's not known about Sakharov. I wanted to say something about human nature. I said that human nature is rotten and horrible. It's also grand and beautiful and mediocre and all those things. I mean, all that whole range of things are, are our nature. That's, that's what we got to deal with, that whole big messy splash. <coughs> yeah, so there questions here? Yeah. wants me to comment on what appears to be a Russian imperialism in Eastern Europe and Afghanistan. Well, if you, if you mean imperialism means the, um, the expropriation of the land, labor, resources, and technology of one country by ruling class of another country, it wasn't. It wasn't imperialism because they brought in aid and they brought in stuff and the, the, uh, it was actually much more advantageous to Eastern Europe. Uh, I would not call that imperialism, I would call that he he hege hegemony, that is, the Russians were hegemonic over Eastern Europe, they really wanted them, uh, and that he hegemony, hegemony got tighter as the Cold War heated up, and, got, and got, the more uptight they got, the more they clamped down. In Afghanistan, I believe the Russians went in on the right side, they went in on the side of a left military against a right-wing uh, mercenary force from Afghanistan, a feudal force the feudal tribesmen and those people who had taken up arms because the uh, Kabul government was calling for the equality of women, land reform, education of children, all these kind of things which they thought were just utterly horrible. And I think the Russians went in on the socially progressive side in Afghanistan and the CIA went in on the retrograde side and the retrograde side has won and there's been terrible killings and you can see what's happening now they're just massacring and still, they're still fighting and killing each other a um, bunch of fanatical so I don't uh, I don't see I don't see either of those as, as really a big problem you know I don't see them as, as, as proof of Russian imperialism or something like that. yeah Soviet imperialism If I was Russian, would I be a Gorbachev voter? If I were, I'd be a, a rarity, an unusual creature. Um, my opinion of Gorbachev was that he was well-intended, but he didn't understand power, and he didn't understand what he was up against. And um, Perestroika didn't seem to have any content. It wasn't clear what the hell it was. What was it that you were really restructuring and how? And then later, by 1991, he got pretty dirty under Yeltsin's influence, you know, when he canceled the whole, <coughs> the whole uh, uh, Supreme Soviet. And, and, drove, and told them to dissolve, and they wouldn't. And he forced the vote three times until they dissolved. They cut off microphones. So he became, toward the end, pretty much, by, by logic, he found himself caught up in a thing which got bigger than himself. <clears throat> and um, so I, I don't think too much of Gorbachev. I mean, I think personally he was a pretty decent guy, but, uh, but uh, the whole system unraveled under his auspices. And he never really saw what hit him, like, like a lot of the people. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my question is not about Russia. It's actually about the far right. Because one thing I was fascinated by was the fact that Russia was the first country to have a fascist movement. She wants to know wh where did the idea come that fascism was a, was a left-wing movement 
And why doesn't the right in this country support a strong centralized government in, in, in the traditional way that the right in Europe does and is acting more like local? Well, it depends what you mean by the right. If you mean the Montana militiamen who want to, you know, just to keep everybody off the front lawn or something, uh, they're very local, it's true. Um, but the right in this country, it uses this strong sense for strong central government or weak central government, depending on the particular issue. If it's social security, it wants to dismantle the government. If it's military defense and Pentagon, it wants the government to grow and grow and grow. So it depends what it is. If it's corporate welfareism, it supports government spending. If it's, if it's welfare for people who are down and out, it doesn't support it because that weakens their moral fiber. Uh, the, uh, the, the fascist Nazis left, well they had, they had a left-leaning wing, the SA, the stormtroopers on the Ernst Strom, but they were wiped out fairly early. Uh, Hitler used the SA to win the Battle of the Streets and take state power, and then he used the state to crush the SA. Uh, and that whole, the whole, the left, the left hinge is simply, you get it with Pat Buchanan, it's a perfect mix. You, you, uh, Pat Buchanan is against minimum wage, He's for the flat tax. He's for tax cuts for the rich. He's a right-wing reactionary. He's not that different from Steve Forbes, except he also has this little overlay of populist rhetoric and talks about the ordinary little working guy against the big corporations. He says that a couple of times, and whoa, ooh, wow, wow. Uh, and that is to attract a mass base. Uh, the right always has to do that. The right represents 2% of the population. It has to find issues like abortion, school prayers, uh, or, or populist rhetoric, whatever, to try to attract people and give the appearance that they're on your side, you see. Racism is a very good issue for them, to divide uh, people against each other along ethnic lines. It, it has a complete success in the dismemberment of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, here's a country with a, with a developing industrial base. They were turning out cars that were beginning to compete with the Germans. There was no room for Yugoslavia in Europe except as a colony. So you break it all up. You break it up in the name of freedom and autonomy and self-determination and the like. <clears throat> and you play on ethnic animosities to do that. What we have to understand what we have to understand is that identity politics can go just so far that even if you think that your greatest calling and mission and feeling of life is to realize the full experience of yourself as a Chicano lesbian, or whatever you are, you also have to remember that you're a working person, that you're breathing the same polluted air, that you're getting taxed up the kazoo, that you are being exploited, that you may not have a job, that you have to pay rent. You also have all those other issues and all the different identity groups that have been working so hard during the 80s and 70s to distinguish themselves, to, to develop their own autonomy, to separate themselves from everybody else, have to realize that they all have a common enemy, that they're going to do it to all of you. They, they, when they come, they will round up the gays and they will round up the African Americans and the Chicanos and they will round up, even, they will even round up a lot of angry white males like me and others in this audience. Uh, and what we have to realize is that all these issues, many of these issues are interlinked. Uh, that is not to reduce. There are particular issues that have particular grievances and particular histories and agendas. Women's issues, gay issues, African American issues, they, they all have that. I, I'm not trying to reduce that to class struggle. But they all are linked in some way to class struggle and they all face a common enemy. It is time for unity. It is time for people to start emphasizing the things that bring them together and not emphasizing the few things that might separate them. <laughs> Yes, is, is, does the anti-immigrant backlash here relate to parallel to the Nazis? Yeah, it's just what I just said, that you find groups, you find irrelevant enemies, and you take people with very real grievances, and you say your problem is due to the, 
your problem is due to whatever the gays or the Jews or the immigrants or the welfare mothers or the feminists or the, this group and you try to redirect people's legitimate grievances about legitimate things that, that have happened to them to these kind of irrelevant things. Dick Gregory, had, and I, hope, I hope some of you went to the march, the unity march we had uh, this past uh, Sunday. <laughs> Dick Gregory had a great point. He said, he said you know, they say, uh, he said, they say African American people are all on welfare. And then they say that with this affirmative action, African American people are taking away all the jobs from the whites. So now which is it? Are we on welfare or we have your jobs? <laughs> I thought it was a good point. Could we, could we make sure the questions relate to, at least some way relate to the content of tonight's uh, talk? I also will not do punditry questions. I'm not part of the McLaughlin group. Nobody, nobody will ask me, who do you think will win the election, blah, blah, blah. Who, what do you think will, blah, blah, blah. None of those questions, okay. These have been pretty good questions. I mean, no Unabomber questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, yes. <laughs> um, I love your book, Inventing Reality. I think just the title alone is what makes sense to me because of the media concentration and, and it's a story that tells us. Did everybody hear this? Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. When I read your book, it, it stimulated me to become much, much more aware. So I thank you for that. My question is... Oh, why can't I get more questions like that? <laughs> Thanks. It's always great to bring your sister along, I think. <laughs> I was shocked. Actually, I'd love to have you do live. Um, I was shocked when you said you were a Marxist. We were all outside going, he didn't say that in any of his books. So my question to you is this. I like the catechism thing, that the fact that it was never really implemented. My question to you, what is your perfect world? Because I think we all see communism and how it was presented in its, you know, all its failings as very non-creative, very oppressive that way, that didn't have its creative outlets. What is your perfect world? By the way, you know, communism, let me just say, uh, there, was some cre there was a lot of creative art, there was a lot of creative dance, the ballet was incredible. When, George, when Balanchine and those guys went to Moscow after 30 years, they were struck by the incredible athletic, energetic, and powerful uh, uh, evolution that ballet had taken. There was some good theater. I mean, it wasn't quite as bleak and bad as, and that's what I always said, it wasn't quite as bleak and bad as, as we kept hearing in the Western press. Um, the perfect world, I mean, I don't have, that the essence of Marxism is that there is no perfect world. That even in the best of societies, there's going to be a lot of imperfect problems and that problems are never always uh, uh, finally solved. I'm a bread and butter Marxist. I believe just in trying to get the basic uh, the basic justices to people and to stop the most horrendous injustices and to show how all these issues are linked. The issues of environmentalism, the issues of sexism, the issues of the breaking up and destruction of labor unions, the issues of, <coughs> of unemployment, so forth. These are all linked. The issues of, of, of wars in other countries. Be more, I'm someday going to give a lecture called How to Think About Politics. I mean, just how to think and have just certain things. And that would be one of the things, though, is we're taught to see these different issues as distinct things. I mean, you get that on the air, you know. And there's a little, a little bulletin here. And in Bosnia, that, that. And in um, that, that. Well, the same people who brought you this are bringing you that and are doing that to you. The same people who are doing it to you this way are doing it to you that way. Um, and... Um, and, and, and even in our education, we have departments, and, and this reality is all compartmentalized in the departments, which isn't quite true. So, uh, if you're surprised that I'm a Marxist, it's because I very rarely write about Marx. I very rarely tell Marx. I just do Marx. I'm too busy doing it. Most Marxists write books talking to other Marxists, which is why nobody can understand them after a while. Well, D Doug, Dow, Doug Dow called that... Uh, uh, how many Marxists can dance on the head of a surplus value? I mean, that's what we really, yeah. uh, but, uh, but what I try to do is, is actually look at, look at a U.S. policy, look at the U.S. political system, look at the media and all these things systemically. And to see in the particularity of any one institution, it's like a hologram. Uh, reality is sort of like a hologram that any one component of it has within it the totality of the other whole thing. It's like a DNA. So when you look at whether you're looking at the court system or you're looking at 
uh, urban renewal or you're looking at Congress or you're looking at the media or you're looking at U.S. foreign policy, what you're seeing within the confines of those particulars is a reflection of that whole. See? And that whole informs the particulars and the particulars flesh out and make you realize the whole. It's a tremendous, it's a tremendous experience. And I was doing Marxism before I knew that was what Marxism was. You see, I mean, it's not that I got this from Marx and I got this model and now I apply it here and there. This was my way of looking at things and that's dialectically. Um, and when I read Marx, I went, oh, yeah, right. I mean, um, Marx, when I, first, when I first was getting radicalized, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I would run into that a lot. I'd say things like, you know, the police are not a neutral instrument. They're a class instrument of control, and they do certain things, and this, this, this. And people would say to me, well, that's Marx, isn't it? That's Marx. They'd look at you like that. And I'd say, Marx? I hadn't read Marx yet. That was a good PhD political scientist. I'd read, I mean, I'd read the manifesto, and I'd, I'd read a little, um, I think, a little um, abbreviated uh, excerpts from, Ca from volume one of Capital and but I hadn't read much then. I'd say that. I'd say things like, um, you know, U.S. policy in the world is really doing this and this and this and this and this. And, and, uh, and they say, well, that's Marx, isn't it? And I'd say, you know, power in America is really not all that democratic because power does this and the resources of power are allocated this way. And they say, well, that's Marx, isn't it? And after a while, I start saying, well, this guy Marx is really something, you know? <laughs> I mean, I go knocking myself out to make an analysis and they're giving him the credit, you know? Thank you. Good night. I got to go. Good night.